What you've just heard is an equalizer in action where we can manipulate different parts of the sound. For example, with a low pass filter, we only let low frequencies pass. In this video, we are going to build our own equalizer, or at least a very basic low pass filter. And for that, we will discover the basics of Fourier analysis and the linear algebra behind sound. So first we ask ourselves what is sound before talking about the Fourier series and then the discrete Fourier series that allows us to transform audio files. So in a physical sense, sound is just variations in air pressure. These air pressure rays, they propagate through a medium like air and then they arrive at your ear and you hear sound. And we can model the sound by so-called pure tones, that is simple sine waves. So here we have a sine wave with different parameters Let's explore them interactively. And I encourage you to follow the link in the video description to get to a Jupyter notebook where you can follow along this video. So let's play with these parameters here. A0 is the amplitude. And when we decrease it, the sound is quieter. And then we have F, the frequency of the signal. So it determines the number of variations per second and therefore the pitch of the sound you hear. And then last but not least, there's phi, which is the phase. If we change the phase, you can see the graph shifts to the left or the right, but we cannot hear that phase shift. Great, so that's the basic properties of a sine wave. And our first observation is that we can model sound as a mathematical function where time is the free variable. Now let's see what happens if we add up two sine waves. As you can see, we can end up with very interesting graphs and that's just by summing up two sine waves. What if we added up many trigonometric functions? Assume that somebody gave you this formula and you just plug in values and see what um, comes out if you add up these sine terms. As we add up more terms, we approach a square wave. I think that's not an obvious fact. Let's try another trigonometric function. This formula here with cosine terms. In this case, we are approximating a triangle wave, just with cosine terms. From what we've seen so far, we might have this hope that we can decompose any sound f into a sum of pure tones at different frequencies. We will then call the amount of each frequency required to form f the frequency content of f. And our hope is that any sound can be decomposed and then also reconstructed just from its frequency content. We've seen that we can identify a sound with a function. Now we will make our first hope more precise, enter Fourier series and Fourier analysis. Before we really dive in, let's first define some basic notation. We have periodic functions, where the values repeat after some period, and then we also deal with square integrable functions, and the function is square integrable if the Riemann integral of the absolute value squared exists on that interval. And if you're not sure what square integrable functions really are, don't worry, just think of them as functions that are good enough in some kind of sense to define properties on them later on. But just note that we will use L2 as a notation for these functions in the following. And then we can define an inner product for that space. So our input are two functions and our inner product just means calculate the integral from 0 to t of f of t times g of t, where we complex conjugate g of t. Just to remind that the inner product for two vectors living in our vector space R3, um, that evaluates to some value and it is zero if those vectors are orthogonal to each other. So with the inner product, we can find out about orthogonality which will be very important in just a second. For right now, we also have an associated norm to that inner product, and that's just given by the standard definition of a norm. Okay, so with this, we can already define the complex Fourier basis, which is at the heart of this video. We define the following set of functions and call it the nth order complex Fourier basis for a space V and T that we'll come to in a second. 
So this f of nt is given by exponential functions, as you can see here. And by Euler's formula, you know that these exponential functions are basically sine and cosine terms. So the basis here consists of these pure tones, these trigonometric functions. And then v and t is defined as the subspace of L2, spanned by the set of functions f and t that we've just defined. And this space, v, is called the nth order Fourier space. Now, we also define f of n, which is going to be the best approximation of f from v and t, with respect to the inner product defined beforehand. And f of n is then called the nth order Fourier series approximation of f. Now, what's this best approximation all about? Let's consult linear algebra for that. We have a theorem for best approximation, and we will discuss that in Rn now, just for the sake of simplicity. So let w be a subspace of Rn, and let y be any vector in Rn, and let y hat be the orthogonal projection of y onto w. Then y hat is the closest point in w to y, in the sense that if we calculate the distance from y to y hat, and here we need our norm, then this is smaller than the distance from y to any other point v living in w. And now what we can do is, instead of considering w as a subspace of Rn, we use the v and t we've just defined as a subspace of all square integrable functions, that was our definition of v and t, and instead of vectors y, we now consider functions f, for example, that might be the square wave function, and instead of y hat, we use fn that we've just defined, which is the best approximation of f. Now the really cool thing is, if we go back for just a second to the Rn space, we have an orthogonal decomposition theorem that tells us each vector y can be written uniquely in the form y hat plus p, where y hat is living in w, and p is in the orthogonal complement of w, that is, it's kind of perpendicular to it. If we now consider any orthogonal basis of w, then we know an exact formula for how to write down y hat. If you're familiar with that, you might remember it from Graham Schmidt. Now, as beforehand, this theorem is not only valid with regards to the space Rn, but also if we plug in our function space and consider v and t as a subspace of it. Then we already have an orthogonal basis of that subspace, because we've defined one, f and t, and we can show that this is indeed orthogonal and even orthonormal. Great, so let's use that formula now to find our best approximation, namely fn. We have a formula, let's write it with a sum and plug in our basis functions for the g terms here. Then what we'll see is that the denominator here evaluates to 1, as one can show that this is not only an orthogonal basis, but even orthonormal. And then we plug in our definition of the inner product here, that we've defined beforehand. And note that we have to complex conjugate the argument of the exponential function. Okay, so we have this expression. What does it tell us? Well, the really cool thing is that this is just a linear combination of our basis functions from our basis f and t, that is, the pure tones. And what's written in front of it is just the coefficients for the linear combination. Let's call them zn. And with this in mind, we can formulate our Fourier series coefficient theorem. It tells us that the set we have already discussed is an orthonormal basis for v and t, in particular, the dimension of v and t is 2n plus 1, as we have 2n plus 1 functions. And then we denote by zn the coordinates of fn in the basis of these functions. So we have this linear combination, where zn are the complex Fourier coefficients of f, and they are given by the formula we've just calculated. And you may not see it right now, but this formula is really powerful. It allows us to access the frequency content of a signal. To see it in action with an example, let's implement it in SageMath, a computer algebra system that allows us to evaluate these integrals. As an example, consider the square wave given by this expression, the signum of the sine wave, or should I say the sine of the sine wave, pun intended. <laughs> when we define this function in SageMath, we declare var t, because t is our free variable, and then we can just write down the expression. Next, we define a function called frequency content that returns the coefficients zn. 
First we define a pure tone, that's a function dependent on t, and we just write down the expression you see here. And note that our function is dependent on n, we pass that in as parameter. You can see that n here and here as well. These coefficients are dependent on n. Then our integrand is just the function we're interested in, in this case the square wave, times our pure tone. And what we return is now the integral evaluated from 0 to t. Let's interact with this by means of a slider, and what we get is this here. So you see, the integral is evaluated and we get these coefficients, and you might remember them from earlier on because we've already seen them in the introduction here. This is how we arrived at this weird sum to approximate a square wave. A common representation of the Fourier coefficients is to plot their magnitude over the frequency, that is, we plot the frequency content. How much is each frequency represented in the signal? And for the square wave, we end up with this graph. There's a base frequency with the highest amplitude, and then we also have higher frequencies represented in it with smaller amplitudes. And they are responsible for the sharp corners of the square wave. And we also see that just every second multiple of the base frequency has an amplitude other than zero. All other frequencies, they don't contribute to the signal. This graph isn't only something you see in literature, but also in real-life software. For example, in Ableton Live, a music software, where you can manipulate sound. And when you use this equalizer, you'll also notice that we have a frequency axis, and we have an axis that tells us how much each frequency component is represented in the signal. But you might wonder, how do you do this with an actual signal that you've recorded? Your microphone measures the variations in air pressures for fixed time steps and for many fixed time steps. Let's see how that works. So in real life, we don't know the underlying functions behind the sound. You may have a WAV file available. That's just a file where all your data is stored. And we can read that into SageMath with the WAV file module provided by SciPy. So we just read that in and we get a sample rate and the data back. This rate tells us how many times per second we sample the signal. For example, here we sample the square wave 25 times per second and we get these dots now. And the higher the sample rate, the closer we get to the original sound. And typical values for streaming services are 44,100 Hz. That is, we store 44,000 measurements per second. Now with this we can define what a digital sound really is. A digital sound is just a sequence, x0, x1, x2, up to xn-1, that corresponds to measurements of the air pressure of a sound f. We call it at a fixed rate of fs measurements per second, and this fs is called the sample rate. Okay, now what about our Fourier analysis that we want to come back to? Well, it turns out that we can develop the whole theory of Fourier analysis also in a discrete setting. And in fact, it might be even easier in this setting to prove the theorems that we've discussed beforehand, as we only have to deal with finite dimensional vector spaces. In this discrete setting, a vector x is represented as a linear combination of the n Fourier basis vectors. So we sampled n times, we have n measurements now. If you've recorded a signal for two seconds, with a sample rate of 44 kilohertz, then you have 88,000 points measured. And that means that your Fourier basis consists of 88,000 vectors that look like this here. And what you see here is just one of these n vectors, where every vector is only different with regards to the small n. And one can show that this set of vectors is indeed an orthonormal basis for Rn. And why do we have the space Rn now? Well, we measured the air pressure and that corresponds to a voltage. And that voltage is represented by a number like 0.478. So that's why we consider the real numbers. And then why is it Rn? Well, we measure n points. That's why we have Rn. Well, now that we have a basis, let's formulate the discrete Fourier transform theorem. What we can do now is construct a change of coordinates matrix from the standard basis of Rn to the Fourier basis we've just constructed. We call this change of coordinates matrix Fn. So this matrix is the n by n matrix with entries given by this expression. That just follows immediately from our definition of the basis. So this matrix or this transformation is now called the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform. And one can also show that it's invertible because the matrix is unitary, so we have an inverse discrete Fourier transform, also abbreviated by IDFT.
Okay, now back to our implementation. We can implement that in SageMath using NumPy. We define a function dft and we pass in our signal as vector x. Big n is then given by the length of that vector and the small n will iterate between integer values 0 up to big n minus 1. So for that let's define a vector that has these integer values in it, like 0, 1, 2 up to n minus 1. And then k is basically the same, we just reshape it so that it's transposed. Now by m we denote the argument of the exponential function, and this n times k will now give us a matrix, and finally we have to take the exponential of every argument of that matrix. And that is the change of basis matrix that we've talked about, fn. What we can do now is multiply this matrix with the input vector, and our input vector is given in the standard basis rn. And due to fn being the change of basis matrix, we now end up with a vector in the Fourier basis. That's the whole point where we even consider this change of basis. We want to go from Rn to our Fourier basis to have access to the frequency content. Now last but not least, we want to implement a low-pass filter as promised. In the time domain, we are able to play the sound. Now with our DFT at hand, we can go to the frequency domain, manipulate the sounds over there by changing the frequencies, and then going back to the time domain via the IDFT, the inverse discrete Fourier transform, to play back the manipulated sound. In order to realize this low-pass filter, what we can do is define a cutter frequency, and for all frequencies above that frequency, just set the magnitude to zero, so that these frequencies don't contribute to the signal anymore. And the implementation isn't too complicated, we just select a specific range of high frequencies and set them to zero. If you're wondering why this specific range, that's just because of some symmetries, we also have to consider negative frequencies. If you want to, you can dive in a bit deeper in the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, great. Now going back with the IDFT, we arrive at the time domain and can play our manipulated sound. So with these basics, we were already able to implement the discrete Fourier transform, the inverse discrete Fourier transform, and a very simple low-pass filter. Let's finally see this in action with the example of the square wave again. And what we do is vary the cutoff frequency to see how it affects our signal. And as you can see, it works as expected. The low-pass filter will take out high frequencies, and these were the frequencies responsible for the sharp corners of our signal. And once we've set the cutoff frequency very low, we only had a basic sine wave left. That's it! We've covered the basics of Fourier analysis, we've seen how linear algebra can help us in constructing this theory, and we also implemented a very basic low-pass filter to only let low frequencies pass. So Fourier analysis is basically everywhere around you, not just for music, also for image processing, and there are so many use cases, and this is just the beginning. If you want to play around a bit more with SageMath, here's why we've used it. It's fast because it executes the underlying code with C and C++ code. We can use add interact to define interactive plots and play audio right next to the code in Jupyter Notebooks. SageMath also allowed us to integrate functions. We implemented DFT and IDFT by using amazing packages like NumPy and SciPy, and those all come bundled within SageMath. So you might want to take a look at it. So I call it a wrap here. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time. Bye. Thank you.